All right, everybody. I'm Susan Gerbeck. If you're watching this video on YouTube or on Facebook, we are doing today a workshop on um, for the work for the About Time project. And this workshop is the first in a series of three that I've written so far. And if I get good feedback and so on, I will continue doing the workshops and I will continue writing more and more workshops over time. I'm happy to do these workshops for anybody who can gather maybe 10 people together or so. Uh, we're, we're doing this on Saturday, the January 28th, 2023, 11 o'clock in my time in California time. And I have five wonderful people who showed up who want to do this workshop. So this will be fun. If, um, if you guys need a, a break or something like that, just text, you know, send me a chat or whatever. And I will, I will try to find a reason for a break. So I did this on Wednesday night at same amount of people and um, it went fast. It, the two hours is fast. So I'm going to put you guys in breakout sessions and those breakout sessions are going to be way shorter than you want them to be, but that's okay. <laughs> Cause we're going to move it along. It's all about getting in there, having discussion, no chit chat, no, no, um, how you doing? It's like, go and do your assignment. It's really quick and fun. Or at least I hope so. It's fun. So what we're doing is this workshop is uh, something, it's a brainchild between myself and CFI. And we've been trying to talk about how to bring people, well, two, several different things. One of them is bringing back people to being, to doing things in person, which seems silly because we're doing this over Zoom. But one of the things we're looking for is possibly hoping that people who attend these workshops will become the leaders or the organizers of the future who will put on other workshops for their for their groups in a way that are um, you know you can you can change these workshops to any way you want and just I'm giving you the the uh, format or at least giving you some kind of way of doing this. So I've kept it really low tech. The slideshow I have is extremely short, um, and my idea is, is that you can actually do these kinds of workshops in person without a without a um, slideshow if you have to, like if you're doing it out of a place that doesn't have uh, a screen. So I'm trying to really keep it as slow, low technology as possible, and we're going to have some discussions. I have a lot of different reasons why I put this together the way I've done. This is my third time doing this particular workshop. And I have ulterior motives, and I'm trying to hopefully get conversation going. Um, if you decide you want to put on workshops like these in your area, for whatever reason, then you can you can modify this the way you want, and I will give you all the slides and all the all the notes that I have as well for in person. Most of my notes are in person. <clears throat> okay, has you do not have to have done the readings, but did anybody do the readings? Carolyn? Okay, cool. Did you read the Skeptoid one? Yes, uh, Brian Dunning, yes. Right. Okay. So one of the other reasons why I'm doing these workshops is in Monterey County Skeptics, where <clears throat> I'm in, in California, we we have a lot of people who come to our our meetups, and they've, they, they have no clue. They don't know anything about the world of skepticism. They are mostly coming in because they're have left the world of religion and they're looking for somebody to have conversations with. That's mostly what I find. And so when they come into the world of skepticism, because we don't have a local atheist group, they're really out of sorts. They don't feel like they have enough background on what our community is all about or that there even is a community. And I think they feel like they're kind of coming into a group dynamic that's already established. You know, and it, it's an uncomfortable feeling not knowing who James Randi is. They don't know what the Center for Inquiry is. They don't understand what scientific skepticism is. So part of the reason why I want to do these workshops is because it is giving them a basic understanding of some of the movers and shakers in our community, where to go to to get more information, and to have a little more of a framework of what scientific skepticism is all about and what we're about as a community. So Brian Denning is a really great resource. And so one of the readings I give is to Brian Denning because I want like people to be able to go to that. Um, it's forcing them, if they do their readings, it forces them kind of go to their site and go, oh, they've got all kinds of stuff. Look at vampires and chupacabras. And so 
all my workshops are kind of designed around people in our community that are resources for them. So Brian Denning's article that um, Carolyn read um, is just it. They're also audio or they're or they're um, uh, verbal. You know, you can read it. Carolyn, can you sum it up in a minute? Uh, no, because I've read five other ones. So tell me the title really quick, and then yes, how to be a skeptic and keep your friendships. Oh, so basically, um, and I think this is a common theme through some of them is find common ground. So don't preach to people. Don't uh, use derisions or call name calling. Um, don't tell them they're stupid or their belief is stupid because you'll get pushback. Find common ground and start a discussion and ask questions um, based on that common ground. Um, and I think he used a couple of uh, paranormal examples. Well, you know, what don't you believe in? You know, if, if you believe in, I don't know, aliens visiting, then, well, what about Bigfoot? What do you think about Bigfoot? And of course, they'll say, well, Bigfoot's just plain crazy. And, oh, well, why do you think Bigfoot is crazy? So as they're talking about why Bigfoot is crazy, then maybe you can kind of insert why you think aliens are, well, not crazy, don't say crazy. Um, but, you know, maybe the thinking um, is parallel of why these things may not be logical. Very good. You Did I say that up, right? You summed that up really well. So the workshop idea is kind of based on this whole philosophy that Brian Denning has. And we know Brian Denning, uh, those of us who know Brian Denning, and remember, hopefully we have thousands of people watching this right now. Hi, thousands of people out there watching this right now. Um, hopefully they are um, learning about who Skeptoid or Brian Denning is and find that he's a resource. But I find, you know, he does these deep, these dives into paranormal things, but also he's got a lot of wisdom because he's been doing this for so long and he's talked to so many people. So I think a lot of his best articles to me are the ones where he talks about these kinds of things. And so I also wanted to point out, I'm facilitating this workshop. This is not my lecture. I am just organizing it and putting this on. So you guys are going to be doing a lot of talking and a lot of explaining, but I am going to cut you off a little bit. So I apologize in advance because I really want to keep mindful of the time that we have. So it's going to be like, sum it up, go <laughs> kind of thing. Anyway, so very good, Carolyn. I would highly recommend that article, how to, I think it's called how to keep friendships and be a skeptic or how to be a skeptic and remain friends with people, something like that. So check it out. I had another one in there too about, um, it was called, um, somebody remember? I'm looking down in my notes. Oh, how to spot pseudoscience, which is a really mm -hmm. good article that Brian Denning also does. And how do you know what, what is pseudoscience and what isn't? Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk really quickly, just really quickly, because Carolyn just summed it up pretty much. Why? Okay, so I have two rules for these workshops. The first one that I'm really trying to get through to you guys is that through the pandemic, especially, we kind of didn't talk to people as well in person. We were really, you know, talking over the internet. Most of it's text, you know, through the through uh, Facebook or Twitter or whatever, and that you lose the interpretation of what you're trying to say, the nuance of what you're saying. So it can come out a lot harsher than it, than it did. Um, there are people that you, that we should just block that are on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. And they just, they're not here to have a conversation with you. They're just here to troll you. I just had one just before I signed on with you guys. And it's just heartbreaking. I put up this article about Harriet Hall and my tribute to her. And I put it out on Twitter and immediately I got somebody saying, well, she's, you know, some, some, she goes triple vaxxed at least. And here she's dead. And it's like, who in the hell are you? I don't know who you are. And it's just some troll. So I blocked them. And I usually don't tro block people. A lot of times I try to have conversations with them, but you could tell this person was just like, Hey, look, there's somebody who has an obituary. Let's post that they've died of, of COVID, you know, and, or uh, the vaccine. And, and it just hurts, you know, to see that because Again, they're not here to have a conversation with me. So those kinds of people, just write them off. You don't have that kind of time. And they're here to waste your time. Um, the, the, what we're here to have, what I'm trying to, trying to facilitate with you guys is how to have better conversations with people 
who are your friends, family, coworkers, whatever, that are magical thinking people, but you don't want to write them off. You like them or you want to like them. You want to get along with them. How do you have these conversations with them? I mean, almost all of us came from a magical thinking background. I know I sure as heck did. <laughs> I see several nods. Um, so, you know, don't write us off. We, we, we may just need some guidance, you know, to get to where we get and maybe, maybe not. So rule number one is the belief that these people have that they're coming to you with a question. Is it a, is it a, is it a immediate harm to them? Immediate harm, not like long-term harm. Like, can they fly? And so they're going to jump off a building harm. Okay. So give me quickly, <laughs> Vincent, you start, give me a, uh, an example of somebody who's in immediate harm of some weird belief. Um, well, I, the only example that I can think of is, has anyone heard of Jilly Juice? No, it was quite obscure, but a few years back, there was this woman from Vietnam, a Vietnamese American woman that um, made this concoction of this really dangerous juice and told people that, well, if you drink this juice, you're going to be cured of all of these maladies. And uh, she actually did uh, talk people into uh, drinking this, this horrible concoction. And sure it was expensive uh, too. <laughs> she, well, uh, depending on what you, um, depending on what you put in it, then it was fine. She wasn't selling the juice itself. She, what she was, was selling the concept of what it did. And so, and I can tell you the ingredients right now. So it consisted of uh, water, uh, high concentrations of salt, really high concentrations of salt, and uh, kale, kale or the equivalent to kale. So it wasn't it, the... It would so that's that's harmful, but it's not immediately that's, harmful because you're immediate. gonna have kale and salt and water. That's okay. Yes, yes. But what was what but, would be, what was the downside of it? What she's trying so to what, do. So what she was doing was she's saying to people, stop your cancer treatments. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And just drink this juice and then the cancer will go away. Okay. So there, there you go, you got right to it. There was one guy, he uh, had stage four cancer and uh, he um, decided that he wanted to stop the treatments. Of course he was dying anyways, but he would have lived just a little bit longer, I guess, uh, with the treatment. But he decided to stop the treatments and drink this concoction. And of course, the concoction did nothing. So, so take the money out of his pocket and give him, yeah. Thank you. Well, Thank you. and then they were showing videos of parents forcing the stuff onto their kids. So. Right. So there's another immediate harm whenever you're forcing anything onto your kids that are that's mm -hmm. quack, re. Yeah, it could be very dangerous. Was, okay, so let's go to this. I'm going to give you some, I'm going to put you guys in breakout rooms, two breakout rooms. So it's going to really go quick. What you're going to be discussing is let me make a breakup room so I can tell you who's in each. And I'm going to change these up a lot. So you will not always be in the same breakout room. So you've got a couple minutes, two minutes. Uh, room one is Gail, Kyle, and Vincent. And room two is Brandy and Carolyn. So room one, I want to hear the do's. What is it you should be doing when you're trying to talk to somebody who has weird magical beliefs? And I want you to think of it this way. The goal of the workshop is to become the person who, who people will come to whenever they have questions about weird beliefs. 
so that when they're encountering something like Vincent mentioned, they are more likely to come to you because they've had past interactions with you that was kind and and so on. So that's your goal. So room one, which is Gail, Kyle, Vincent, you're going to, you got two minutes. You got to come up with some do's. What is it you do? What is it you with your body language or you say to continue to be that person that people will come to whenever they have um, uh, magical beliefs? Randy and Carolyn, I want to hear the don'ts, the things you do not do. Hmm. Go. Now I'm going to close all rooms because it gives them two minutes <laughs> to force them to come back really quickly. Okay, so I'm going to pause this for a moment. Not a lot of time. <laughs> oh, two minutes is not a lot of time at all. <laughs> and speaking of time, one of the things, I'm, and you all come back in different orders too, so you're in different places you already left. Yes. I'm so confused. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's, it's random for me too. So one of the things I also want to point out with you, <laughs> workshops, these, these discussions you're going to be having with people are going to be, again, co-workers, family, friends, neighbors, people that you're going to have over time conversations with, not a person you sat next to on a, on an airplane or you're riding next to in a bus who sees your shirt and goes, what's that skeptic thing? I mean, because those are conversations you'll have with people, but what we're talking about today are longer term conversations that you can have and, and have some time with them. Okay. Who's the representative on Brandy and Carolyn's team? I'll go. So okay. give, give me your, give me your don't. So um, our first one was um, don't ridicule the person or, or the belief. Um, don't just throw facts at people. Um, don't use scientific jargon. Um, try and keep it conversational. Uh, don't continue to engage if it's a lost cause. Um, or if it's something you can return to, like Randy said, um, and don't engage if the if the topic is emotional hot button for you. Probably a good one. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't heard that before. That's a very good one. Okay, Kyle, Gail, and Vincent, what did you got? Who's a representative? I didn't tell you to pick Go for it, Kyle. Yeah, sure. Okay. So I think we hit two big ones. The first is uh, doing by leading with I statements, never you are this, but I am this. I see it a different way kind of thing. Uh, and then secondly, finding uh, something you can agree upon. So even if someone has a weird belief, there's probably a Venn diagram here of something that you meet in the middle. Make sure they see that there's a ground of agreement. Good. What other don'ts don't do? You asked us for do-do's. <laughs> They're the doo doo. <laughs> and they're the doo doo. <laughs> <laughs> she said doo doo. Okay. <laughs> and I got that on video. So, <laughs> okay. So, yeah, well, let's come up with a couple really quick. Besides, what, what verbal, what body language things should you not do? Eye rolling. <laughs> Eye rolling's probably I'm out. accused of that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, get size and, you know, yeah which i'm guilty the head the head bang <laughs> <laughs> i'm kidding yeah, probably, i'm kidding i've never done well, that but it's but. probably a yeah probably a no <laughs> don't laugh oh that's you know, a big one, yeah. that is the hardest thing whenever i've got somebody who's close to me you know you feel comfortable with not to make that <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're gonna be kidding me you're kidding me right right yeah um you guys have all these experiences i'm oh so come on Vincent. you get out more you can have some experiences so much an introvert that i don't have these experiences <laughs> well <laughs> but i have... ask questions instead of yeah uh, making it into a, a dialogue you know a monologue or a, a lecture make sure you ask lots of questions so they are engaged so they feel like they are part of the conversation and you're not talking to them yeah, not talking to them or talking down to them. Because the whole idea, as I keep saying, is you want to be that person when somebody's like, should I drink this, this concoction and stop my cancer treatments? That they come to you and say, hey, you know, we've had great conversations in the past about Bigfoot and stuff, but this just seems a little more like 
to out there on the fringy thing, but I'm my friends are telling me it's a great idea. But let me run it past you because you know you're you're reasonable person. So okay, so good, we got that. Now <clears throat> you're putting your thinking caps on. And Carolyn knows where this is gonna go because she's done her reading, but you guys don't. So this is kind of kind of fun. You have a friend or a coworker, imagine whoever your, your fictional person is in your life that is, this is going to be, you're going to run through this, through the whole scenario. They are coming to you because you have been that person that they could have conversations with in the past. And they're going to have some odd questions about things that have happened to them. So I'm going to bring you through this slowly and at least three workshops. So they're going to come to you and they're going to say, Hey, I have had this weird experience. <clears throat> I'm going to screen share this so that you can see what they're showing you on their phone. They're showing this to you on their phone. I've had this weird experience and I don't have these on me anymore, but this is a picture of it on my phone that these were these burns on my body. And I don't understand. I, you guys can see them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, so there's four of different ones and they're like, not straight on. They're like, you know, some are part, part, part burns and it looks like the rest of the pattern is barely there. So they've had these burns on them and they took a picture of them and they cannot figure out what it must be. They're faded. They know they didn't burn themselves, but something's going on. And now they're just like kind of freaked out a little bit about it. Okay. So your friend knows more than this, but at this moment, this is all they're doing is showing you their phone and saying, what the heck is this? So that's all you all you know. You don't know anything about anything else. Carolyn, forget you know what's the rest I'm of the trying. article's about. <laughs> okay. So all you have is that little information. So I'm going to give you two minutes. Again, go and talk to your friend about and use those do's and don'ts, or don't don't use the don'ts, but do the do's. And how what phrases are you going to say when you come back? Or what are you going to say to this friend? That's all you know. You don't know anything about it, except you do know that this friend is kind of on the woo-woo side, you know, that they, they go into this magical thinking idea sometimes. So you, you don't think that the person is going to say it's a burn, you know, and they forgot about it. They, you think there's going to be something there that's a little more than that. Paranormal. You, you think it's going to go there somehow. Okay. So go and go and have that little conversation. And we're going to come back and discuss. Oh, I should. Turn off the video, huh? So interesting to me. Here they come. And we're back. And we're oh, back. We were booted. Okay. Yeah, it's fast. And I gave you three minutes that time. So Brandy, Kyle, Vincent, somebody in that group, tell me, what were, what did you say? We recommended they see a doctor, ask them to think about what was going on that day that they noticed the marks. Okay. Yeah. Carolyn Gill. Skeptical of the pictures. Like where did where were the pictures taken from? Well, no, these are their they took them off their body. They took a picture of their burn. Here's my burn. Yeah, I'm kind of skeptical of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Show me the burn. Show well, the burn's me. over. They haven't seen you. The burn's leaks. gone. The burn's uh -huh. gone. But boy, let me show you this. I've been showing it to all my friends. Go ahead, Carolyn and Gail. What do you come up with? Go ahead, Carolyn. Oh, okay. Um, it, it kind of going what you guys said is, um, well, take me through your day. You know, um, if they thought it was like a paranormal explanation, I would ask them why, why would you believe it's paranormal? Um, um, if they gave me some source 
well, this I found this on the internet. Oh, well, tell me about that source and, and why do you trust that source? Um, try to find common ground and say, you know, look, uh, there was a time that I woke up with some weird scratches and I was trying to figure out what happened. But you know what? I went through my day and I remembered I was doing the rose bushes the day before. And, you know, so it made sense to me. Is there is there a possibility something like that happened? And then ask, just keep asking them questions um, without talking down to them, you know, to try and get their logical process of why they're concluding it's a weird burn or it's a, a paranormal burn. Okay. So now your friend is okay with whatever you said. And they're like, all right. Now they feel a little more like they're going to open up to you a little bit more. And they're going to confess to you that they did a little research because one of their friends they showed their phone to, because of course they're showing this burn to a lot of people, right? One of their friends said, well, there's this video of these burns and here, let me give you a link. So now your friend has watched a video, all right? And in this video, I'm gonna show you two screenshots and we're gonna talk about these screenshots. Um, in this video, this guy, here's what your friend is saying. Oh, it's some guy's friend, she's, and he's, um, He's real important and he's he's got this video out there and the and uh he gives a conference and he's talking to people and lots of people are having these burn marks and um it looks like it's coming from ufos so they're burning people it's mostly women but they're burning them and and the guy we don't know why and the guy says that it's happening all over the world and um, remember, you're you're got to display good behavior because your friend's telling you this. So you can't roll your eyes. You can't fold your arms. I know this is hard because I've already read it. So yeah, it's hard. So you have to kind of be like, oh, okay. Try try to try to go into that. You don't know where this is going. You know, where your friend starts telling you this, you got to kind of go, oh dear. How do I how do I clear my face? Don't roll my eyes. Don't make any sighs. Because you want to hear this story <laughs> from your friend. So this is what the person's telling you. Now I'm going to show you two screenshots and let's talk about this really quick. Because we here in the skeptic universe probably are a little bit better at this kind of thing. But keep in mind, this is what your friend is seeing. So here's the first screenshot. This is a screenshot of the video of this man. His name is Jacques Valise. And your friend doesn't know a lot about this. I mean, they, they all they've done is watched a video and talked to some friends of theirs. Now, what do you see from this vid screen? This is the screenshot for the video that they watch. What impressions do you think that your friend has come up with just, just from that? Somebody give me something. Well, he looks professional because he's holding a book. So he must be an expert in some capacity. Yeah. We've got the obvious alien themes. Those are what jump out to me first. Yeah. <laughs> I thought this thing right here looked like a, a UFO floating in the background. It's probably just water and then that's an island, but it kind of did look like a UFO. Uh -huh. It seems to be a pyramid in the cloud, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, Lord. Pyramids. Oh, these, I think, are aliens back here. Are these spaceships or something? But it looks like a professional... Um, presentation so it gives it some appearance of authority he looks pretty good okay here's here's the next screenshot now this is the man talking so your friend has watched this video so let me keep in mind that there's a crowd there we never see the crowd but there's an obvious crowd of people he's he's presenting at a large conference i guess in the desert but it is a lot of people attending and He's got the he's he's addressing people and they're giving him Q&A and all that. So your friend has watched it. So what just seeing this guy there, what are the impressions you think your friend has of this man? Well, you uh, just said the fact that there was a large crowd and the large crowd is paying attention suggests that there's something worth paying attention to. There's some sort of popular belief that he's um addressing trust and authority yeah. yeah he's an older man looks professorial possibly he knows something 
So when it, when I did this presentation in uh, Mater, in Salinas, Mark Mark Edward was in the class and he says, "Well, don't you guys know who that is?" Yeah. I'm like, "No, I don't know who that is." And he says, "Jacques Vallée is this guy who who um, the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind." Yeah, yeah. So you recognize it, Kyle? Oh yeah, yeah. This is old school, like uh, Chariots of the Gods kind of alien stuff. So he's like oh, had a movie. Yeah. Did he have a movie? made about his life or was he what was did he write the screenplay i don't quite know how he's connected to um the yeah i don't know the history super well but jock valet is just in the pantheon of ufo people for a while so he's been around a long time oh yeah and he's got something to do with this close encounters movie so he must be kind of famous so there's probably the rabbit hole effect where if there's one video, you're going to find a whole bunch of this particular person. You'll probably, Schultz, your friend, her hypothetical friend, will find a whole bunch of other videos. Oh, I'm sure so there's a rabbit hole to go just, into. <laughs> the gods, yeah. Authority. Oh, yeah. So so keep this in mind that you have a lot more background in this than your, your magical thinking friend. So what's obvious to you isn't obvious to them. So remember that too. So they're they're under this impression this guy's really famous. He's got he's looks great. He's got books, at least one book and movies and stage and presentation and sounds like thousands of people are listening to him. So already you you were kind of going to lose on this battle. So now if if you're not careful your friend is going to go, well, no, what do you know? This guy's really famous and he's got a really sexy French accent and, <laughs> and, and he's, he's speaking at a conference with thousands of people there. So um, now your friend is going to tell you that they, a little bit more about the video, okay? And this is what your friend is going to tell you, that they saw this on, on the video. And it is this kind of stuff. So now we're getting this link to UFOs. So this Jack Vallis person says that somebody came to him with one of these burns in 2016 and it fades in about a week. And then in 2017, she starts, the same person has said, well, I had this burn in 2016, but now there's this alien spacecraft that's floating over the top of my car. You know, I was driving, my kids were in the car, they're witnesses, we took a picture. And, um, you know, he goes into detail about like what kind of car, I mean, what kind of Sam uh, phone was like, like that's important, but he's, he's, he's giving details, which sounds very much like maybe a police report or something like that. He puts a lot of credence into this, that there's witnesses, there's a phone, there's a photograph, but this, this thing is hovering over the car. And so He's equating the burn mark to the to the thing floating over her car, and therefore it's UFO related. So now you have this much information, which is a little bit different than you had going in on it. Just she was showing you a UFO. I mean, she's just showing you a burn mark. So now your conversation is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to put you in a room really quick again. You know the drill. We're going to go up fast. Go. Okay, so now if you're watching this video in, hi, um, if you are doing this in person, it's up to you if you want to try to move people around from, from in-person groups, like they're always talking to the same people in their little breakout groups, or if you should move them around, because remember, you're trying to keep this under two hours. So it's up to you. It's a great idea to move people around so they're interacting with new people because then, of course, it helps your community and people feel more comfortable talking to somebody if they've already broken the ice with them. And UFOs and burn marks are pretty pretty good at, burn, at <laughs> breaking the ice. So it's up to you when you're organizing something like this if you should move people around or not if you can i think it's a great idea but if it's if it's going to take time where people have to move their stuff and and they they're like oh i don't want to move my chair you guys come over here and it takes too much time don't bother anyway 
So what I'm looking for when they come back is if somebody says, did you, can I watch the video you watched? What's the video called? So here they come. You, uh, you didn't uh, say what we were supposed to do. <laughs> you're supposed to be talking to your friend about they give it. Now, what is it you're going to say to them? So let's see. Mm. Uh, Brandy, Carolyn and Kyle, what did you come up with that you're going to tell your friend now that they've shared a little more of their story with you of what they saw in that video? I guess I can go. We took about a couple of routes. Uh, one is sort of engaging on the path directly of who is Jacques Vallée? What is his history? Is he credible? Is this someone you should trust? Um, and another possible path of engaging a little bit with this, even if you don't think it's a burn from a UFO, but saying, acknowledging that if it is, that's unprecedented and a doctor needs to look at it. And we also did talked about separating the two events. What happens right, right. to separate the two events? Um, are they even related? Could we look at these two things separately and see if there's um, other explanations separately? That's really good. That's what Gail brought to my attention was why there are two separate events. How are they related? So, but the big thing I think that yeah. if, if you don't mind, let me throw in a, a, a problem when skeptics argue with other people is we argue with them. Exactly. The word and would argue. Yeah. these all become the basis of an argument that you don't even plan to have. I'm going to tell you why you're wrong is the basic message here. Mm -hmm. And instead, trying to get into their frame of reference and simply not agree with it, but get them to start thinking about it. So I would say the unrelated is the obvious one to me, but I wouldn't say, Jesus, those don't sound related to me kind of thing. What I would say is you, you tell me you had this experience and then you tell me you had this other experience. But why do you think that one was related to the other? Could they not be two separate experiences? Tell me why you think they might be related. Because they're going to have trouble doing that. And right. as they're having trouble doing that, they're seeing the flaw in their argument. You're not telling them there's a flaw in their argument. Very good. good. That's really well said. Well said. What, what are you going to say to your friend next? Okay. Again, I think we need to really think about how we... We phrase things, we say, just like Gelda said, we we argue with people. We want to get to the we want to get to the result and say, you know, well, this is dumb. Of course, of course you, you know, <laughs> what? Mm. But how do we, what are you going to say to them next? You've they've just told you this and you're and you've said what you just told them, just what you just told me right now. Now what? Go see a psychiatrist. <laughs> No, no, because you, again, you're taking, you're, you're giving them the, the you're, if you're telling them what to do, you're taking control. Of oh, them. I know. So I'm trying to get them control of the situation. So the first thing I would say is, you're telling me that you had two experiences, one with the burns and one in the car. Can you tell me why you think those two are, are related in some way? It, I don't see the relationship that you seem to be seeing. Yeah. The burns are what bother me. Seeing lights in the car is one thing, but I agree with Vincent because I see a case of self-harm here. Yeah. And the, and Kyle brought up a good um, point later. It's like, well, if this is something that's happening, let's get it documented. Go to a doctor. Yeah. yeah. And you're, but you're going to, okay. Mm -hmm. what, what I'm looking for, maybe I wasn't clear, but that's okay. What is it you're going to tell your friend next? It's probably... Can you look at the video? Hmm. Right. Oh, yeah. Because your friend has just said, I've watched this video about this thing. Your friend isn't saying I had this experience at this UFO. Your friend is saying, I watched this video and this is what this guy is telling us. So what you want to do is you want to watch that video. You want to see what your friend yeah. saw, right? Because we're having this conversation over time. So you're going to see him again. So you would say, well, hey, can I see that video? I want to see it. What did you look up? Can you send me a link? Okay. Right? Because because if you just if you just if you just come in straight up and say that video is ridiculous, but you haven't watched it, then your credibility is kind of low, right? Yeah. 
And I think I made the mistake of making the assumption that I already looked at the video. Like they sent me this. <laughs> no, list. not yet. Okay, I'm going to go. Because <laughs> you did look at the video. Yeah. Though. Yeah. Something so, like yeah. that happened to me recently. A friend of mine was talking about um, spontaneous human combustion. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I told her, I was like, well, I'd have to look at the videos. I can't just tell you a blanket statement, yeah. you know, one way or the other and have to see the videos. So, yeah, yeah. exactly. Because remember, your friend has seen this video and is convinced of yeah. something. There's something going on here with UFOs, right? And so um, <laughs> your friend has seen this. So if you just say, well, that's bullshit, then your friend, you've just told your friend he's an idiot or she's an idiot, right? How, how could you believe this? How stupid of you? But if you say, let me watch it. Another thing when you say, let me watch it, is you're saying, I want to listen. I want to understand this. You know, I care. I want to have a good laugh. No, I'm, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that to you guys, but I, no, can't I know to them. Right. Okay. So now your friend has shown you the video or given you a link to it and you've watched it and you say to your friend, Hey, it's a coworker, maybe. Hey, um, on, on lunch today, can, you know, can we, can we, I saw that video. Can we talk about it? All right. So you're going to have like a little moment with them and say, Hey, I did watch that video. I want to talk about, it. I got some questions. So now here's what you saw in the video. I'm going to show you what a screenshot. So here's what the guy is saying is that, that um, the video shows that these, these things are all over the world and they're all different kinds. So uh, it's mostly women that it's happening to. And um, that's a little strange, but they're all a little different. So he doesn't know why these are appearing, but he does think that, you know, some people have gone to the doctor with it and there's no health problems it's just a burn and the doctor says you know that's strange i don't know why and they're gone after two weeks but they're burns but they do not remember burning themselves there's no way that they remember a burn and they think if i was burned i would remember being burned okay so this is kind of where we're at now the person is saying i i in this video this guy's saying it's a phenomenon now you're looking at this going, okay, I'm going to Google it, or I'm going to look and see if there so might be something out there on the internet that would explain this. Cause this is news to you guys. I mean, how many people have you, how many times have you guys seen these burns? Have, has anybody ever raised this to you? I've heard about this. I've heard about it. This is, you're this is old Canada, stuff. <laughs> no, this is, this is old stuff. Well, you're an introvert. So I don't know how you, you said, just said a minute ago this that you, this is happen. from back in the 90s, if I remember correctly. Okay. Are you thinking of crop circles? Oh, and what? I'm thinking of crop circles as well. Yeah. 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 This They're there. So, so yeah. you're you've you've seen this video and now you're saying, I'm gonna Google it. And what you come up with mm -hmm. is you find that um Metabunk, which is <laughs> Mick West's kind of a forum where they discuss strange and unusual things. And the people who are on the forum are the topics they do are UFOs, chemtrails, um, conspiracy theories. So they have like a niche. They don't really talk about vaccines and stuff like that. So they, so Mick West had said, had heard of this phenomena and he did a bunch of research and he went to his forum and he says, Hey, you guys, what do you think of this? And there's this long discussions of people posting videos and pictures and, and articles. And they say it's, it's um hair dry related the people are blow drying their hair or and they just zap themselves really quickly and they burn themselves but the burn doesn't show it's like touching a stove and you and you go oh that was stupid but you don't think about it until a while later you feel the burn on your fingers you go oh that's right i did burn my hand picking up that stupid thing but these hair dryer burns it takes a few days for the burn to actually show and in that amount of time people haven't they're not equating the two. They're they're they forget about the burn, but you can see the matching. So he was able to on Metabunk just go through and and collect these images and then match them up to hair dryers. 
So like here's a burn mark that, that appeared on somebody and then they showed how it matches exactly with this hairdryer. So they did this whole deep dive into hairdryers. So what they're doing is called debunking a claim. They debunked a claim. Okay, so let's go over here. Now, you have heard about these hair dryers because you just read this article that Mick West wrote. You got, you, you watched the video, you saw the hair dryer marks, and now you are prepared to have like a break or lunch or whatever with your friend. And now you have to have a different conversation with them because you have a lot more information. You, you feel like you have some sort of solution but you want to remember the goal of this is, is that you want to have a conversation with this person later on in life when they start having conversation, uh, have something more harmful. So, so, so now you're going to go talk to them again about this knowledge you have now. What are you going to say to them? So go for it. Okay, so this should be coming back in a few seconds. So let's make sure we're all there. Now I've got all these notes here on the side with a lot of writing of ideas of how to go about this if you're having an in-person meeting. So I'm trying to still break this down slowly. And let's see if the groups come back and they are using their best... Um, words to continue the conversation with this person and don't yell at him but what about the hair dryers there they come hey susan mm -hmm. apparently we're being recorded i've been waiting i just thought i'd do that i've been just... waiting for you to say that vincent thank you were you <laughs> I was waiting for it earlier, but I kind of forgot now. So you, you caught me off guard. Yeah. Oh, cool. That makes sense. And I, Carolyn, Carolyn just said she'd been waiting for that, right? Yeah, I've been mean, it would made it all the more better. <laughs> okay, so I, tell me. I'm totally kidding. How are you having this conversation with this person now? Um, so oh, can I go ahead? Sure. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay. So what I said was um Hey, I watched that video that you sent me and I found that that was really interesting. So I, I had to Google it because it was so interesting. And I came across this article and I want to send it to you and I want to know what you think about it because I've actually had a similar experience to what they're talking about in the article. So I'm going to send it to you and I want you to let me know what you think and so we can talk about it. That's very good. You will continue conversations with that friend if they read this article. But you said it gently. That was really well, Carolyn. Okay, somebody else. I think our best point was similar. Like we watched your video, one of yours, you watch one of ours. It's tit for tat. <laughs> but in this case, I, I might go a little bit more video. aggressive uh, once I have this article in my hands and say, okay, surely this explains some of the burns. How can we now tell which ones are accidents and which ones are really paranormal? Mm -hmm. Very good point. It, and it's true. You're, you're saying to them, I've watched your video out of respect. Now you should probably watch, read my article or at least you've explained it to them enough to say, um, I think there's other alternatives here. And uh, when we did this in person, Karen, you know, you guys know Karen from Trivia. She she said, I think it's okay to kind of lie to him a little bit. And that's what get, uh, Carolyn said a little bit like, you know, I was blow drying my hair <laughs> and I got a burn just like that. And I didn't remember getting it. It appeared later. And so, <laughs> you know, why are you, why are you equating this to a burn? You know, are you saying that a UFO came and zapped me? So, and wiped your memory. Yeah. It's just there's some there's time that passes between the burn marks showing, I think, and they just don't realize that it burns. And if you read the article, you'll see that Mick West tested it out. I mean, <laughs> did he burn himself? He burned uh, he burned something else. I think he did. He measured, wow. he did what Mick West does. He measured the temperature and he he, you know, he I think he burned uh he put ink on the 
he put ink on the outside of the hair dryer and then like That's touched smart. it to his skin. Carolyn, does that sound right? Yeah, but also I think um, in Mickweck's book, if you have them engage, like if you do say, I want to know what you think about the article I'm going to send to you, it it's also a further thing of respect because you want to value their opinion of well, what I sent you. So it's a little bit of empowering on them as well. I agree. I feel like if you can make it seem like they came up with the alternative explanation somehow that they'd be more open to it. Absolutely. Yeah. You're trying to make them safe face. Yes. Yeah. They're going to feel stupid. Yeah. Okay. So let's take a moment. I'm going to turn off the, the recording. Let's take it like five minute break. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Going back to where we were. Let's see. Oh, okay. Thank you, Kyle. Um, one of the things that we're, we're talking about with our friend, our friend, is that how to, how to have that conversation with them again, saving, allowing them to save face. Because how would it feel if after you watched their video and you Googled and you found McWest's article, you took the video, you took the McWest article and you gave it to him and said, here's your answer. How do you think they'd feel? Stupid. The, yeah, and not respected by you just handing it to them like that and saying, here's your answer. Get over it, dude. What's wrong with you? And they might get defensive too. <clears throat> yeah, Karen said, Karen said that, you know, I got one just like this when I when I burned my hair. What's it in and she was pointing out that it's a woman, mostly women thing. Here comes Gail. And that would make sense because mostly women do their, their hair. Do the, uh, hair thing with the hair dryer. Long so. hair and and your I remember doing this with a curling iron. Mm -hmm. Of course, it didn't leave the same kind of mark. I was trying to curl up in here and oh, I got yeah it, yeah uh, right here. Here's yeah. Letting go get that back in. Mm -hmm. Amazing technology we have, but you know, it's not perfect yet getting there we're getting there yeah y'all can you hear me now you can hear stuff moving around maybe she doesn't think she's online quite yet i would think she'd be there but this is what happened to her a minute ago so she might she might still be having problems well okay i'll move on and then if she joins us she gets in she gets in if not she can listen to this and and we know she's here with us in spirit. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that maybe if you were, especially if you're a woman, you could say to your friend is, um, I had something like this happen to me myself or happen to my friend or, or, or I know of a woman this happened to, or how about wording it like, why is it mostly women? Do you think that would work or do you think that would be condescending? I think they it's might. case by case. Yeah. They might come up with an illogical explanation, though. They're stealing their eggs. To yeah. I mean, yeah. Mars needs you know. women. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that Jacques says is he says that he had thought that maybe aliens were on the street, like, like with a ray shooting at the women and putting <laughs> burn on them as they're walking around. And then he said, but that can't be true because the burn mark appears under the clothing. Not that I don't know why the ray gun wouldn't be able to go through the clothing, but right. okay, here comes Gail again. Hopefully she can get in. But um, if she can't get in this time, I'll just tell her to restart her computer. Maybe that'll help. But so he says, so it can't be that. And then there's all this conversation about like, what could these burns be? What would be the reason for it? And when Mark was talking about this at my workshop, he was kind of saying, well, well, what's more likely that you burn yourself with a hairdryer or an alien has singled you out for what would be the reason? Mm -hmm. What would be the reason? Do we need Branding. Them? I think they're selecting, I think they've been fattening you up and you're going to be on the menu for some alien fest. Well, I mean, if they're really Branding you alien. like beef. 
in alien lore, though, I mean, it would be like a marking, right? So they know to zap you back up later for your eggs, <laughs> you know? I mean, just going into the, the alien. They're branding the most fertile women. <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, that's what the mindset is. So that's why I, I don't know if I really want to entertain the whole <laughs> why is it more women than men you know Miguel says she can see and hear us but oh good she can't she can't uh we can't hear her and we can't um facilitate for her <laughs> where's my keyboard That's no, funny. Uh, yeah. just pushing these buttons. Yeah. That's okay Miguel if you want to try restarting your computer maybe that will help that's what they say yeah restart it and that's tech tech 101 restart your computer and, and go on okay yeah that's what she i had did to do start it twice so she knows her tech stuff. well i might be the alien and have <laughs> well gail you're here we we know you're here so okay so going maybe it'll change when i put it if i put him in a breakout room i don't know okay so here's what's going on your friend has told you all this information. You're hopefully having a good conversation with them. You're going to give them the article, or hopefully, if you if you don't give it to them, you're going to try to um, at least explain to them what's happening in this article. And the end result, if you've done this hopefully correctly, is that you're going to be able to allow them to make the. Um, <laughs> Gail says. If it isn't aliens, I have this happen before with repeated trips to breakout rooms in rapid succession. Okay. So maybe the aliens, oh, wait, what was I saying? That hopefully they have come to the realization you're going to not hand them the answer, but kind of help them come to the answer themselves because people are more likely to, to um, come believe what you believe or you know come to the same realization you have if they feel like they've done some of the work and they've come to the realization on their own right or with a little guidance so if you can say to them yeah here's what i found what do you think of it then maybe they'll they'll say yeah i think that's pretty believable and you know what i read that whole article and that was fascinating now i'm going to tell you that jacques himself says that he knows that people are burned by hair dryers and that that causes some of the burns. And so Mick West in the article, he says, well, why do you, I, I think he interacts with Jacques and says, well, why do you, if you know that some of those burns are caused by hair dryers, why didn't you just say they're caused by hair dryers? And Carolyn, do you remember what Jacques's answer is? I don't remember because I think I was, yeah. <laughs> Jacques's answer is whenever he, people send him the burn marks that match up with a hairdryer, and it's obviously a hairdryer, he removes them from the website and he doesn't say anything. He just takes them down. So he's afraid that if he completely says all of the burn marks are from hairdryers, that nobody will send him the hairdryer things and then therefore not all of them had been explained and so he wants to leave the rest as being possibly ufo related because possibly the person's had a ufo encounter so i'm interested in what you guys think about that so why do the aliens have a hair dryer on board <laughs> no some are hair dryers and not all of them. oh i see the ones that haven't been explained like they're odd marks those might be aliens and he doesn't want to remove those UFO people love that idea. They often comment on how like 4% of blue book files got marked unsolved just because there wasn't any information, but they latch onto that idea. 4% are unsolved. Well, in the paranormal world, the whole thing with orbs, which I just felt Kenny's head explode. Um, the whole thing with orbs. I heard it. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, you will hear some people say, well, most of them are dust or can be explained by dust or water vapor or whatever in the air, but there's that one or two percent. And so I had learned to say, well, where is the one or two percent coming from, though? Where are you getting your information that there's the one or two? What are your sources for that? Um, and if there's a mountain of evidence that can be replicated of what orbs are, 
photographically, where what is the testing measurements for that one or two percent, you know, that are parallel? right? What makes those few? Uh, how, how is that testable? How is that yeah. quantifiable? I, I'm not understanding. Can you explain that? Because we've got a mountain over here of replicated photographs that you and I can go out and stomp in the dust and create. So what's different about uh, these other tell ones? Me where they're getting the information on this one or one or two percent. How how are they coming up with this? Okay, now I'm going to try a breakout room. I'm going to put Gail in a room with three and let's hope this works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, and then we'll come back. And um, what we're going to do is what you're going to be discussing right now is this idea of debunking. Okay, so mm -hmm. there's debunking and there's pre-bunking. I used to call pre-bunking um, inoculation theory where if you give people enough and, and if you watch the Kenny Biddle talk last night with uh, Melody, um, Melody King, King. yeah, if you, if you heard that, she talks about that. She runs a, a class, um, a community college class where she has people who are non-science majors that are taking her class and she's talking to them about critical thinking and she starts off with all sorts of really great stuff. I'd love to have been in that class years ago, but She's got this idea that if you teach them cold reading or if you teach them pre uh, about paranormal things in advance, then they'll have a lot more skills to deal with it whenever they encounter it. And this is exactly what I've been doing for years, that there's this idea that if you because the, the, the stuff you hear now may not be the stuff we hear in a couple of years. So you can't explain every little thing to them. You know, like when you get a burn mark on your body, that's a hairdryer. That's not, <laughs> you can't, you, you don't even know about that possibility in the future. So you have to kind of have a way of giving them enough skills so that they can say, you know, we learned about multi-level marketing scams or pyramid scams. And then when they encounter something that's similar in the future, they'll say, you know, that kind of reminds me of this multi-level marketing stuff we learned about. It's sort of similar to that. And they have enough spider sense to go, something's wrong here. Maybe I should look at that. So there's debunking and there's pre-bunking. So I want you to discuss in your little breakout room for a couple minutes, what, what is the difference? Is debunking helpful? Is where does this go? I'm going to give a couple extra minutes in this. So go and, and talk about that for a minute. And we're going to come back and talk about it when you come back out. And hopefully Gail's can be heard or she can chat with you guys in the room. Okay, so here they're going to come back right now. We were cut off in midstream. Jeez, you don't know. I'm kidding. <laughs> you don't know how a timer works? <laughs> well, we try. Yeah. Okay. So this is a really interesting concept because anybody who attended SciCon this year, this was what we talked about. Almost all the speakers were like talking about pre-bunking, 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 and they've done it in lots of different varieties. It seems to have a lot of success. And Gail mentioned to me that this is one of the things she does in her class um, her Ollie, O L L I class. If yeah, you teach Ollie. them before they have the belief, you have a better chance because they don't have to give up a belief they already have. That's really well so Thank you, Gail. So it, it's. I think this is the successful. Um, I think it's successful to have better conversations with people to give them some kind of information. But where does that leave us with debunking? which is what I think the skeptic community has been really focused on for years and years and years. Here's the answer. Here's the answer. Where does that leave us? What is the value of debunking? Go ahead. Aaron and I did debunking or did uh, debunking first. So we, uh, I'm sorry, we were, we were sidetracked. Um. Well, with debunking, there, you know, according to the article, they there is some success, but it's it's moderate success, um, and it comes to where we talked about earlier that make sure that um, you're not using scientific jargon when you're doing it, and it it also um, you have to do it in a way where you're not just throwing facts, regurgitating facts at them. So there is some success with it. But in, 
relating to uh, that's why the pre bunking comes into. I'm sorry, I'm being invaded. Um, what the heck is that? <laughs> it's a cat. The library is haunted now. Um, oh, there's a cat. <laughs> yeah. It's only part of it was showing you. I was like, what the heck? Yeah. So, um, but pre bunking um, again gives people their, their own their own skill set. And what else do you think? I think with uh, debunking, it depends on um, how closely held the belief is. The, if it's a belief that's too close to their heart, that you would have to use pre-bunking instead of debunking. Get to them before they've had it. So do you think that Mick West's article, that's a debunking article? So how much value would that have if you had at the beginning of this conversation, when your friend said, um, you know, I got these burn marks and you said, stop right there. And you Googled it and you handed, he said, oh, well, Mick West is, he hadn't even read the article yourself. And you're like, Mick West has already addressed this. Here you go. How, how valuable do you think that would have been in your conversation with your friend? Not very. No. I think they would feel like you were dismissing them. Because they watched a video and everything, and the guy was French and had a whole stage and body. <laughs> he looked so professional. But yeah, exactly. So I think that's what we've been doing in this community for a long time. And I'm just as guilty as anybody else, is that we're, we're just trying to go like fast and we're, we're forgetting all of the conversation and we're, we're just trying to solve the solution right now. Here's the solution. It's a hair dryer. Can we go to lunch now? <laughs> and also with pre-bunking too, um, when you when you're showing them different examples, um, you know, if someone comes up to you, well, Midwest is only one guy, and here's all these people who have these experiences. So I've come across hundreds yeah. of articles, you know. So if you're able to kind of teach them, I guess the inoculation theory, but also critical thinking of looking at the authority or, or looking at the credentials. Um, okay, this guy may have thousands of articles, but there's nothing to back up what he's saying. Or this guy has one article, but here's the systematic you know, breakdown of how he came to his conclusions and how, is it replicable? So if you teach them things like you're talking about uh, pre-bunking tools, then I think that's more helpful. Gail has a really good uh, comment here in the chat. It says the trumple, the trumple, the trumple. I don't think she said the trumple. The trouble with debunking is that you are asking them to say or think, thank you for teaching me how wrong I've been. Yeah. This is my favorite example from Carol Travis, she says. And that's a really good example, Gail. You're right on. Um, do you think that articles like McWest that are pre that are debunking something? are valuable? And if so, where? That's my question next. I mean, for sure they're valuable. The easiest way for a person like myself who knows who he is and knows I'm going to get a straight, clear answer right away that maybe I might interpret for my friend, but it's an authoritative source. Right? Yeah, it helps to have authoritative sources. So, um... And I think what's helpful is the way the article's written of, you know, there's there's a method to it. I mean, he shows, he demonstrates um, the evidence of why, of how these are worked um, and, and multiple times, not just one example, but multiple examples. And if you were a sadist, you could even replicate it if you want to. But um, so I Make think- for it, the team and burn yourself. Yeah, so I think it's, I do think there's value in it, but I guess it, it has to be done in the ways that we were talking about before is empowering the other person to help them come to their conclusion. And that's why I was saying, would you be willing to read this and let me know what you think? I think that the second part of that is very important. Let me know what you think after reading this. Gail says, it will work for those who haven't already adopted that belief and are wondering about it. So going yeah. to Wikipedia, which is, you know, at my heart, is Wikipedia a debunking site or a pre-bunking site? 
I would think debunking. Because I never really thought about it. I haven't either. Um, well, it, it, it has a lot. Yeah, it has a lot of facts in there and pointing to a lot of articles, but it's almost like a summary instead of really deep dives sometimes. Although in the more hyperlinks that you go into, you can go through that little rabbit hole and you can read about a topic that maybe you thought you already knew everything about it, but then when you read the topic and then you see in the hyperlink, oh, there's some criticism here and oh, I didn't know this. So maybe it does help people question. So maybe it is more pre-bunking. That's a hard one. <laughs> Gail says it's both. It depends on the person who's doing the research. Yeah. I think that, And the article. Yeah, and the article. So I think that if, if you allow somebody to save face and they come to you and they say, hey, what's this homeopathy thing I've heard of? And you say, you know, I've heard some bad things about it. I don't have really time to go about, talk to you about it, but you might want to check it out. Start with like a Wikipedia page. So it just gives you an overview of what it is. And then maybe read the citations at the bottom. And then you guys go back to work and you just do your thing. And your friend goes to Wikipedia, hopefully, or does a Google search. And one of the first hits they get is a Google uh, Wikipedia page. And then they go there and they read through it. I think they're more likely to come back to you the next day and say, you know, I did some research and I think you're right. I don't think this is quite right. This seems sketchy to me. And then they'll say to them, they'll say to you, I did my research and I'm not stupid. I figured this out by myself, but really Wikipedia was just a guide mm -hmm. to help them figure it out. <laughs> Debunking site too, because we often say in the Wikipedia articles, here's, here's the history of the thing. Here's a description of the thing. And here's the answer or what experts think is the answer. So I guess it depends on, on the situation, but debunking is valuable in my opinion. I think it's very valuable. A shortcut for us to get some answers and like kyle said you know you can go to it and get a summation of it and you could repeat it to your friend but i think what the skeptic community has been doing is using the debunking they're missing the conversation they're just going from you got a weird belief here's the debunking and i think we've just been missing that whole middle somewhere and i think that's why we may not be as successful as we probably could be with our conversations with people. What do you guys think? Well, and I know I've mentioned this to you before and, and maybe a couple others in the room. Um, I would have been a skeptic much sooner had I met, not been constantly told I was an idiot. <laughs> so, you know, um, because I was in the- By ghost skeptics, hunting. you mean? Yeah, because I was in the ghost hunting community. And even though I was by this point well on my way to going over to skepticism because I was asking a lot of questions. I was saying I was questioning certain techniques or certain things I was being told from TV and books that I had been, you know, but I still had, you know, there were still a lot of skeptics or maybe they were pseudo skeptics and I didn't know it at the time that just ridiculed me. And so, yeah, it made me, it's like, wait a minute, I'm asking questions. I'm relatively, I don't drool on myself. I'm relatively intelligent. I'm, you know, I'm educated and you're calling me an idiot. So it just made me back away. That's one thing that I was always very careful with when we were, when my group was posting more on Facebook, I didn't want to share the mean memes and things like that. I wanted to be very careful. Like, Educational, yes, but staying away from all those memes out there that just make people look stupid or feel stupid. And I actually got pushed back um, and I was cyber stalked for a while by some, again, they may have been pseudo skeptics and I don't didn't realize it at the time, but I got pushed back because as a former teacher, I was an administrator for a paranormal site and we even on our site said we are here for education and I was like one of the only teachers on there and I got pushed back because I didn't want to do those memes and I didn't want to make fun of paranormal groups who are posting things that we knew what they were like orbs or camera flare or something um, but I took away some skeptics fun because they just, they, they got, that's how they got their jollies. They loved making fun of these groups behind their backs or even, you know, and posting things all over Facebook about them. And I said, how is that education? 
if we're just making fun of people, we're not at reaching out to these people saying, hey, I looked at this. I think there's another explanation. Do you want to look at this? Like a book by a certain friend of mine about orbs. And um, and I got a lot of pushback from that. And, and so I said, like I said before, I would have been a skeptic a lot earlier, full-on skeptic, if it wasn't for the pushback I got. And then we're just going to be talking to each other all the time if we do that, you know, if we are constantly mean to outsiders. I actually met someone at a bookshop out here who was on the fence of skepticism. Like there were things that he believed that, you know, were more on the pseudoscience side, but he was questioning things. He wasn't like fully invested one way or the other. And this was like, just after everything started opening back up again so we weren't really active as a group and he was like well i told him about us and he was like well would you welcome someone like me who's asking questions i'm like of course you're exactly who we want to come <laughs> so right. and, and that's why i wanted when we were doing skeptical that's why i did mention kenny biddle because he actively talks to ghost hunters Mm -hmm. He act, you know, he's constantly going to paranormal conferences. He's friends. He's still friends with a lot of ghost hunters and stuff. And that's why I thought he would be a great speaker for Skeptical to show how to communicate with, <laughs> pardon the pun, the other side. <laughs> um, so um, I think he's a good example of that. Well, absolutely. We have a lot of people who, like I said, almost all of us came from the paranormal community in some way, even if it's religion. Uh, Gail has, I'm going to, I'm going to be Gail here. I can't do a Gail voice. I don't remember who said this. You can't reason someone out of a belief. They didn't, they didn't get that belief from reason. And then she says, Carol, yes, Carolyn, there are both skeptics and supernatural believers that like to think they are special because they have the truth. Can you put truth in quotes that the rest of the world doesn't see? And you're right. And I'm as guilty as anybody. I really am. I love all those memes and making fun of people and stuff like that. I love all of that humor. And, you know, I need to be aware of that, that I may be having people who are looking at my feed because almost everybody in my feed is skeptics and is going, well, I guess I can't raise a question with her or I can't, I can't because she's just going to make fun of me. It's, it's, I don't know. I, I, I enjoy the humor of it. I yeah. like puns. I like puns. And to me, a lot of this humor is puns, you know, and it, it is, I guess if we're, we can figure out a way, of, I, I don't have an answer. I think the discussion is helpful, but, but, but we should, and I'm not going to hold back on this. I'm fine with attacking those people who are doing it willfully right yeah. anti-vaxxers you know damn well what they're doing absolutely psychics who are talking to kids absolutely. they know damn well they're cheating they know what's going on and those people i'm not going to back off on but the people who believe it especially um <laughs> gail says most humor is about stress relief and and when i go and interact with people and if, if you guys know of me interacting in the psychic world with people who are believers i'm beyond kind but i do point out things like you know well why did he you know your facebook page is wide open and i found it on your facebook page in a couple of minutes why do you think he didn't find it on your facebook page so these things like that trying to help them along and whenever they they say oh well, do you believe the psychic is a fraud i say well what do you think and all the research i've done points to it but they all say that okay that psychic's a fraud but not but my other psychic. Real. yeah right and so there's no way we're gonna that there's no way we're gonna get rid of all this pseudoscience and magical thinking and i don't know if i want to i i kind of find it fun i find the ghost stories and all that great and but we're not going to what skeptics can do too i i think we have to be careful and just like you were saying before of what we i would rather promote what we do believe and what we do um, and what we are trying to get across than what we're not. And in some skeptic groups, they make fun of a lot of religion because a lot of them are atheists or agnostic and stuff, which is understandable. But 
is that the face you want to put on? Is that going to welcome people who are kind of on the fence? Um, if you just put jokes about how, how stupid religious believers are, or do you want to put more content that is, hey, look at this article by Susan, or look at this really cool article put out by Mick West or Kenny Biddle, or, uh, you know, I'd rather be part of a group that promotes what we're about than not. It's really well said. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there for the moment because we're we're under time and I want to continue being under time. So um, thank you guys for showing up. I'm going to put this video up. It's hugely instructional. I think that uh, people watching this are going to be like, you know, there's no solution. I just think that we need to have these discussions. And I think that these discussions are powerful in, um, in furthering how we appear to people who are questioning their beliefs. And I think that maybe, you know, in general, we're going to say maybe that's probably not an appropriate thing to say. Like, for example, I have never liked ad hominem attacks. So when people make fun of Trump or whoever for falling or not being able to close an umbrella or whatever, I don't like that. I mean, you know, silently I'm going <laughs> laughing, but really is it, it's not healthy. Let's make, let's make, let's talk about the policies. Let's talk about the stupid things he's doing that are serious policy problems. I don't, I don't care that his hair is flopping over to the side or anything like that. Um, Gail says there's another OLLI class, Ali class taught by someone who is a conspiracy theorist. He teaches about 9-11, the moon landing and Kennedy assassination. There's no way I'm going to change his mind, but I invited him to present his point of view in my class. And he's now asking me to present it is his so she can go to his class and present a view so if we keep these conversations open and and you don't know what opportunities you're going to be on i've had i've been on several paranormal shows that are ghost hunting shows that have had me on to talk about psychics and i always try to keep it to um the specific topic at hand and not try to get into a lot of other things but i do find them saying to me but what about this and what about religion and what about this and you're like well i'm not an expert on those but here's my thoughts but here's what i think what do you think kind of stuff so there are readings if you want to read them i think that you'll have a better understanding of a lot of this and i think it's interesting to read the mcwest article and maybe even go to the video jacques valet's video and watch i got 20 minutes in how far did you get carolyn not very <laughs> I got 20 minutes. Somebody else told me they they listened to the whole thing, but they were listening to it in the car. Well, and I also <laughs> skipped to the end and listened to the questions from the audience. And you oh, can... the questions, the audience. Oh my God, you guys, at least listen to those. That was wild. The things yeah. that people, you're thinking, okay, somebody's going to challenge them and say, well, something about hair dryers and, and no, <laughs> they, they are full believers. And they, it was, oh, boy, it was colorful. Around, yeah, so the there are more readings. If you get a chance, take, take a look at them. I think the most important reading of all of them is the skeptoid episode, how to be a skeptic and still have friends. And um, I'm going to hopefully continue doing these videos and these workshops. If you, I, I, I like the small group format, but it'd probably be nice if it was maybe like 12 people or something like that, because then I'm at least getting farther. So if you like them, share this video with other people or invite people to the others. I haven't decided what I'm going to do next. Um, I have to make sure uh, I feel like this is getting somewhere with, with our community. Do you guys have any thoughts and do you think it's valuable? Do you think I should, you know, what do you, what do you think? Definitely. And um, I did really like the pre the from pre-bunking to debunking or debunking to pre-bunking by um, Nick Keller that was in the yeah and I I was supposed to start with that one when Eric and I and from Center for Inquiry on this article by pre-bunking by Nick Tiller that she's talking about I felt like it was just a little too academic so I to me I I read it three times and I didn't quite get it so I at least not well enough to explain it to somebody so I thought I'll 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 tackle the subject of pre-bunking and debunking but from this viewpoint to me is feels like it's easier i don't know i'm not and then i agree and but then right after was um melanie's um article about how to sell pseudoscience and some of it was basically definitely with um i i think the way she put it but also helps you with pre-bunk is an example of pre-bunking Oh yeah, absolutely. It. So I think that this is a really valuable article. So hopefully the 
hopefully you guys got something out of this. That's right. I do. Say you Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> don't flood me. Don't flood me with your pre. Okay. Hmm. So um, I'm going to put this up on YouTube. Cool. All right. Thank you guys for showing Thank up. You. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Susan. Thank this you. Was great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It was great.